Financial independence, retire early. Saving over 50% of your income so that you can retire by the age of 35. This isn't all what you think it is. I've been following this particular path since I was 21, nearly a decade of time now. And I can tell you that there is a huge lie contained within this philosophy that I don't think many people are aware of. It has completely changed the way that I view this. Now, this is not going to be a fast-paced video. There's no fancy editing. There's no yellow text along the bottom of the screen. There's no cinematography. Not all of you are going to want to watch this thing, and I don't really care. I'm doing a ton of things wrong in this video. But for the few of you that will, for the few of you that are seriously interested in financial independence or may have already started pursuing this path because they so badly want to live a life of freedom, my hope is that through this video, I will be able to connect with those of you personally and share a little bit of wisdom from somebody who may be further along the path than you already are, or to connect with other like-minded people. Hey, maybe even you're further along than I am. And for context, in case you are new and you're watching this video, what I'm about to say is not to brag or to <laughs> try and show how sick I am or something like that. It's just to provide a point of context. So I've gotten to a place in my life where whether it's tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, I can wake up every day and pretty much do whatever it is that I want to while feeling peaceful, content, and fulfilled. And this is only partly possible because of money. This is something that I want to hopefully make clear by the end of this video. I probably honestly have less money than you might think hearing that. So today, there are very many churches who rule over a specific domain of knowledge, and they rule over it with a very strict dogma. And no, I am not talking about religions. Since I have partly a financial background, I can identify a few of these churches within the financial world. There's the Church of Fire, there's the Church of Dividend Investing, there's the Church of Index Investing, there's the Church of Crypto or Bitcoin, who are, you know, can be quite different from one another. And all of these churches have people who consume the same materials, the same books, which essentially makes up the Bible of that particular church. And they all repeat the same phrases, have the same daily practices in their lives, and they find joy in their echo chambers. But I don't like church. So today, I'm going to be taking the role of the heretic in exile from the Church of Financial Independence. So let's begin with a background of my story into how I began my journey of financial independence. And it really began with a social contract. And that social contract was to be a member of what I would call the working class of society. Now, this contract is a deal that is essentially signed the moment that most people are born without their consent and without their signature. Let me explain what I mean by that. Historically, the working class referred to a class of society that was predominantly made up of people who performed manual labor, and they had very little power, and they also had very little time freedom or location freedom. Today, we still use that definition to describe a subset of the population. But now, in more modern times, we've also created a new term the middle class, which supposedly describes a class of society who has more power and can pursue something called the middle class dream, where they can raise a family, own property, have time for leisure, and be a part of their community. Sounds quite nice. Well, I would suggest it's all a fugazi. It's a wazi, it's a woozy. 
there are only two classes of society, the working class and the not working class. You either trade some of your daily time for money or you do not. Whether you are an investment banker working in New York making 300k per year or you're a manual laborer living up in Sudbury, Ontario, making $50,000 per year. You're both working class. Come Monday morning at 9 a.m., you are compelled to be somewhere. And when you are at this somewhere, you have to do a series of tasks that you did not entirely select to do on your own. And then you cannot go home. You cannot leave until certain external criteria are met. Unless you are someone who was born into wealth or figured out how to become a sovereign individual at a young age, either through entrepreneurship or something like crypto, the working class life is what awaits you for the next 30 years or so. Now, I think it's important that we understand two things here. First, didn't you agree to be a part of this working class? After all, didn't you sign your employment contract before you started working? And two, doesn't society in some fashion have to, for lack of a better word, force people to go to work? How would things get done otherwise? How would I eat the food that I ate today? How would I be speaking to you right now? How would all of this be possible if there was not some mechanism that compelled people to work? Well, the answer is we don't really know because there has always been some type of compelling mechanism that has existed in human society. Historically, this was done in very barbarous ways that were absolutely downright terrible. Whereas today, the mechanism is much more geared towards trying to use the carrot as opposed to the stick, if we're going to use a metaphor like that. Although, many locations around the world still do experience pretty abhorrent working conditions. Now, broadly speaking, the way the modern compulsion mechanism works today is everything you need to live, all of your basic necessities, they require something called money, as we're all very aware. But the only way to obtain this money, again, broadly speaking, is to trade your labor or your skills, something like that, for money. Now, if we look at this compulsion mechanism and we take it to its extremes, well, then we can see that if I choose not to trade my labor for money, what would happen? In the most extreme case, I would become destitute, maybe on the streets. So this acts as a form of punishment that is embedded into this social con contract that you were essentially born into. And again, taking that logic all the way to its extreme shows us that this is a mechanism which compels or forces us to have to work. Sure, you could say that you don't have to sign that particular employment contract, or you don't have to sign an employment contract in general. Just as you could say that you don't have to sit in your cubicle from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. There's no physical barriers preventing you from walking out and walking out of the building and just going home. But taking those actions to their completion means that you will end up destitute and on the streets. So unless you want that, you have to. Now, I personally have no problems wanting to contribute to society. While I'm not very old, I have spent time contributing to society in various ways ever since I was a reasonable age to do so. I've contributed with my physical labor to city public services. I've contributed my analytical skills in an office role in corporate finance. I've contributed in a more commu community-oriented fashion as a sports referee. I've done volunteer work in various capacities, to name a few examples. I'm more than happy to do my part 
And I would even go as far to say that I am ambitious and generally like to strive for more. And I believe that most of us are under the right circumstances. And I can also appreciate using something like money to be an independent, unbiased, non-human mechanism to compel the population into work. I'm sure many of you would think without a mechanism like this, no one would show up for work, right? But while I do understand that, for me personally, on an individual selfish level, I'm not cool with that. I'm not okay with being compelled to do anything. I think it's morally wrong. And while it could be true that this does serve the greater good of society at large, I think on an individual level, it is morally wrong. And there are many such cases where you could say an evil act does perhaps serve the greater good of society at large. In addition to the issue that I have with compulsion, this working class contract or deal or societal contract that you were entered into, over time, or at least in this window of modern time that we are living through right now, seems to have become increasingly unfair. Just working your average job is simply not enough to get by anymore. The cost of living has risen too high, and wages just haven't kept up. You can't live a reasonable life with any kind of breathing room for self-actualization. And on top of that, we are told that this deal, this social contract, is free market capitalism. But then we watch what happens to the elite members of society. We watch what happens in the banking system currently, and we see that they're not using free market capitalism. That's socialism, ba bailing them out currently, because people who are supposed experts were not able to manage the balance sheets of banks at a fifth grade level. This is not the first time this has happened, not even in just my life. Anyway, the bottom line for me is, I think compelling society to do something in this way is morally wrong. It treats us like herding animals who need to be corralled within a fence. And if you're paying attention, you should notice, as you go about your daily life, that there are many other cases of this. But most of us, we aren't paying attention. Unfortunately, many of us do walk around like animals being herded. As I said, it's subtle. And that's because this indoctrination into this begins at a very young age. The education system is little more than a preparatory framework to get you used to following a specific set of rules. Now, this isn't some type of evil conspiracy or anything like that, and 99% of teachers have no idea that this is what's happening. They're not evil, they're just doing what they think is their job. The rules that you are taught to follow in school are the very same rules you will have to follow later in life at your job. And in turn for following these rules in school, you get rewarded with grades and percentages and marks. But later on in life, you don't get those. You get money instead, which essentially acts as an approximate proxy to the grades, marks, percentages that you received in school. So in high school, yes, I had these thoughts in high school. I've always thought I was a bit of a <laughs> bit of a crazy person. But yes, in high school, as a young teenager, I thought a lot about this stuff. And so I wondered, how do I get myself out of this deal? Especially because I only have a few years before I'm essentially entered into it and there's nothing I can do. From day one out of the womb, I had a problem with authority or what I saw as unjustified authority. I hated when an older figure would say something like, 
you have to do this. And I would ask why. And then they would say, because I said so. I hated that. My parents and my grandparents have told me tons of stories about how I would argue with them as a little kid and just like point out errors in their logic and it would just drive them crazy. So imagine me as a very, very difficult kid growing up. I had to know why I should do something. I would never just do it. And so when it came to this working class deal, I would ask everyone, why? Why is this set up the way it is? Why do we have to do this? And no one could give me a real answer. It seems like most people hadn't even really thought about it. Not only was I defiant like this, but I was also very determined. And I believe you have to be if you are, if you are going to break out of this I don't know, system, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word, because it's difficult to break out of by design. If most people break out of it, society collapses, so you're really not supposed to. My parents always tell this funny story of me when I was a boy. I loved to play road hockey with my dad in front of, on the street in front of our house. And when we were playing, I took it so seriously to the point where I demanded that my dad actually try playing against me. He had to put in 100% effort because I knew when he wasn't trying. And so if I scored a goal on him when he wasn't trying, I didn't consider that a goal. I needed a worthy opponent. So I demanded, you have to try. So then he would say, okay, I'll try. And then he would obviously come and score a goal on me like nothing, I was a little kid. And I'd be like, all right, now we're talking. Now we can actually play. So we'd keep playing. I'd have a really hard time scoring and he would keep scoring more goals. And then after a while, he'd be like, all right, that was fun. Let's let's go inside now. And I'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. I have to go, I have to win before we go inside. I have to win. But you also have to try. I have to beat you an honest win against you. And so we would be out there playing for hours because obviously I was not going to be able to beat a grown man at road hockey when he was giving his full effort. So after a period of time, I would have to give up, but that's the type of crazy kid that I was. All of this to say, a lot of the time and more so now as I look back on it, I realized that I was not a very normal kid. I had definitely this defiant streak and this very determined and intense personality with some things. And so I really directed all of that stuff to try and figure out how do I get myself out of this working class deal. But I grew up in a town of less than 10,000 people. I think there was like 5,000 people living there maybe at the time that I was growing up as a young kid. So I was isolated. I didn't know anybody else who was thinking this way or who was trying to basically build a life on their own outside of the perceived system. And I did feel a little bit crazy. I was like, it felt like it was only me. And so I had a lot of additional questions at this time. And one of the biggest questions I had was, why are we even here <laughs> in the first place? Like, what is the meaning of all of this? So I started, I started studying spirituality on my own. I started studying Buddhism and Hinduism and began a meditation practice. Again, basically all on my own. I don't even think my best friends really knew about this at the time. Maybe only a girlfriend that I might have had. Probably was the only person that I really talked to about it. And I thought to myself eventually, well, you know, a lot. this really resonates with me. I'm learning a ton. It's pretty incredible. Maybe this is the way out. I mean, it is in a way, but maybe I should become a monk. Maybe I should go walk the Himalayas, renounce everything. Maybe that's the way out of the deal. I'll just cut all my karmic knots, find enlightenment. But over time, <laughs> I realized that that was not my destiny. I'm not pure enough. My heart's not pure enough. I'm okay to admit that. I'm aware of that. 
it is not my time to become a monk. I believe I still have many, thing to, many things to learn and lessons from the material world. So then, if I wasn't going to become a monk, well, then I guess the only other alternative was the working life awaited me. And so I progressed onwards in that direction while still asking questions and trying to search along the way. And more what felt like the currents of life, as opposed to my own intentional decisions, I ended up finding myself studying finance and then going on to work in the financial world. Now, it's important to note here that at the time that I did go to study finance, I actually had a lot of different opportunities available to me because I actually did do a pretty good job of following the rules in school and achieving those percentages and grades, or whatever, as a result. More so because I kind of figured out how to game those rules and systems and put in minimal effort and get maximal results. That's a story for another day. But to give you a little, I guess, tangent piece of context here, I first actually got accepted. I first accepted my offer to study neuroscience, of all things. And then within the first week of classes, I actually ended up switching that for a degree in accounting. Now, so once I arrive at my first real job in the finance world, I absolutely dread it. Just dread, 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 dread it. And I dreaded many other jobs in my life as well. Basically anything that had any kind of authority structure over me dreaded going to it. I dreaded a schedule dictated by somebody else. I dreaded pointless small talk before meetings as if anyone actually cared how my weekend went. I dreaded having to do a task that was so inefficient or unproductive just because somebody above me said that I had to do it. I'm sure many of you can relate to this. I mean, how common is the character in Office Space or Fight Club for that matter? Minus the whole, <laughs> I guess, fight club and then blowing up towers or whatever happened. It was, it's been a while since I've seen that movie. But above all, I dreaded the fact that this was my reality now. Every 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday to Friday, for the next 30 years of my life, give or take. Now, when you start a career... Is it not supposed to feel like this is the start of your independent life? Well, for me, it felt a lot more like the end. Fortunately, at this point, I found what I thought was going to be my savior, my white knight in shining armor. It was the fire movement, financial independence retire early. I first stumbled upon this community of people. I think it was after reading the four hour work week. I don't remember exactly how I stumbled upon it, but I think it was a tangent related to that book. And I, then I eventually found the community on Reddit. And that was the place where I just completely dove right in. I consumed all the books that everybody consumes, consumed all the blog posts. I set up all the same things in my life. I started saying the words, practicing the practices. I was a full member of this group of society. I thought this was it. This was my way out. It made so much sense. I finally found this community of like-minded people. And in, you know, maybe 10, 15 years, I'd finally be free. Free to do everything that actually mattered to me. Free to go on a walk in the forest in the morning instead of commuting to work. Free to exercise and strengthen, test my body free to read and study about the various questions that I have, free to learn any skill that I want, free to adventure, free to meditate, free to spend time with the people 
that I love and free to share what I've learned with others. To me, that's an ideal life right there. Now remember everything I just said, because it's going to become important later. So that was the background of how my journey into financial independence started. Now let's move into how my journey progressed over time. In my first three years of pursuing this philosophy, I thought it went very well. I was able to save up something like $90,000 in my first three-ish years of working. I thought this was amazing. This is actually a story that I've documented and explained on my channel already, and if you're interested in that, which you might be if you're still watching this, uh, you can go back and check out those videos if you have not already. And at this point, which I had built up this chunk of money, a series of things also kind of came together where I felt like it was an opportune time for me to take a leap, a big bet on myself. This is because through both studying finance and then studying this philosophy of, of fire, I had learned all this really useful information about bank accounts, investing, budgeting money, you know, all the stuff that you learn. It's really useful. And as I was very passionate about it and talking about it a lot, I realized that almost nobody knows this information. So I thought it would be a very valuable thing to share with people. I was already helping my friends and family with it. And so I thought, what if more people knew about this? What if there was a way to make it accessible to the average person? And from this, I decided that I wanted to try and start a YouTube channel to do exactly that. And Cash College was born. Cash College was the original name of my YouTube channel when its primary focus was making financial education accessible to everyone with a kind of overall philosophy of we're learning all of this stuff so that we can increase our financial independence. Now, for a period of time, I was both working and running this YouTube channel. But as I said earlier, I wanted to try and make a bet on myself. I had saved up all of this money and I thought that this YouTube channel could be a potential career path for me. So I decided to take the leap. Now at the time that I took the leap, it was a genuine leap because I think I was only making something like $5 a day on YouTube, not a sustainable living by any means. But I thought with this huge cash buffer I had, you know, I could try and make this happen for three years. And if it didn't work out, then hey, it probably wasn't meant to be. <laughs> but the funny thing is, I think it was a month or two after I quit my job, I ended up making a sustainable living off of YouTube. So I didn't really need to save up all that $90,000. I probably only really needed a, a, a few thousand, I think. So I was very excited about doing this because... I knew this was a career path that could not only potentially accelerate my journey towards financial independence, but also give me a lifestyle of more freedom and flexibility. So these were two things which appealed to me greatly. But within this seemingly great opportunity, there was also a trap embedded within it, somewhat similar to the trap of the working class contract. As my channel continued to become more successful over time, I increasingly began to see it as my means of salvation towards the promised land of financial independence. And so I increasingly became attached to its performance. And its performance would often clash against my true identity. It seemed like, you know, in order to find the highest levels of success on something like YouTube, you had to make 
ridiculous faces in your thumbnails constantly or you had to rigidly define yourself within a niche and then follow the typical starter pack for that niche so that the the mass population could understand you oh you're a finance guy so that must mean you like cars watches and you like saving money on your coffee right seemed like you had to post every day or three times a week and then chop up your content into into TikToks and reels and just shove it down everybody's throats whether they wanted it or not this felt wrong to me but on the other hand i also wanted my freedom so bad so i i agonized over this constantly i i felt I felt so conflicted about whether or not I should do these things to the point where my heart began beating strangely and my mental and physical health definitely deteriorated for a period of time. This was until it finally clicked. What did I define as freedom earlier? Were you paying attention? Free to go on walks in the morning? instead of commute to work, free to exercise, strengthen, and then test my body, free to read and study and ask questions, free to learn any skill I want, free to adventure, free to meditate, free to spend time with the ones that I love, and free to share what I've learned or what I find interesting with others. Well, this morning, I went on a walk in the forest with my dog, Autumn. The morning before that, I went to the gym. The other night, I played ball hockey with my team. Today, after I'm finished recording this, I'll spend a few hours reading a book about the nature of reality from a biocentric view. This weekend, I hope to pick up a new piano to continue learning how to play. Every morning, I try to make time to meditate and practice things like Qigong, and every day, I spend quality time with Autumn and Justine. But the craziest thing is, the way I earn a living is by sharing what I've learned or what I find interesting with others. Is this not everything that I've ever wanted? Have I completely fooled myself? Don't I already have the freedom and independence that I so desperately desire. I don't have to do any work if I don't want to. I don't have to post a video if I have nothing to say. And so sometimes I don't. For a week, for a month, doesn't matter. I don't have to make stupid faces in my thumbnails or define myself by a niche or a starter pack of associations. I don't have to degrade my work by watering it down into short form clips. While my journey in this career path has definitely not been perfect and without its compromises, I'm very proud of myself that I never did those things because I didn't want to do them. And actually, this comment right here really hit home for me because doing this it actually terrified me. The idea of pivoting from a, a, fina a finance YouTuber to what I actually am terrified me because I, I had never seen it done before. Switching identities basically seemed like a kiss of death. But when I relinquished the obsession with financial independence and realized that I could be free right here, right now, I just needed to accept myself as who I am and then live with the consequences. So I began and will continue to make the work that I would make if I was otherwise retired. Work that is done in and of itself and not for a reward. The work itself is the reward because it's just enjoyable. And that's why I think it worked. That's why I think this is true. So I think the lie contained within the fire philosophy can be summed up like this. In order to achieve fire in 10 years or more, you have to resign yourself to a life now 
where maybe you're miserable or you're doing things that goes against your character, your values, your morals, just things that you aren't being you, you aren't actually living the life of you. But you're accepting that because it's only temporary. And after this temporary period of time, you can be free, you can be free to actually start your life. I would suggest that you are doing yourself a terrible disservice if you view your life this way. Do you honestly not believe there is some way for you to live a life that is resonant with who you truly are and earn a living? Do you not believe that the very thing you fantasize about yourself doing in the future is not something you could be doing today. And I'm not speaking to the people who want extravagant wealth and want to spend copious amounts of money on things. Obviously, you need a lot of money to do that if that's you. I'm speaking more to the people who envision a life of freedom and independence. Now, don't get me wrong. This is a very powerful philosophy with a lot of very, very powerful knowledge and it can greatly benefit I think everybody's lives but imagine you spent your 20s and even some of your 30s fixated upon this future life where you could start living as you when right now some of the best days of your life are passing you by when you could have that now let's say you imagine yourself being a baker in your fire days. You, you imagine yourself pulling fresh sourdough loaves out of the oven. This is a fantasy that I am, I am very sympathetic to. You can, I'm gonna put up some loaves that I've personally baked on the screen. If you really love baking that much, is there not a way to make that a reality right now? Could you not, for example, go and train with some of the best bakers in France and then come back home and maybe start a little stone oven in your backyard and maybe sell bread to some of your neighbors and then eventually open up your own bakery and then, hey, maybe even write a best-selling book about your entire experience doing that? That would be a pretty interesting and cool story, right? And a really fulfilling experience to live yourself. Well, it's not just a story because that's actually what somebody did. And that person, through their book, is the reason I became inspired to start baking in the first place. His passion changed his life and it touched mine at the same time because he had the same realization that I did, albeit he had it later in life. He was working in the banking industry and he was feeling completely unfulfilled by it. So he, left. He abandoned that career entirely and tried to pursue his love of baking with no experience whatsoever. And now he's a world-renowned baker with multiple restaurants, bakeries, and best-selling books. What if he waited until he reached his fire goal? What if he waited until the moment he felt like he could start finally living his life? Would it have been too late? Would he look back on those years he resigned himself to basically living as someone else and look back on that period of time with regret? These days, before I make important decisions, I try to view them through the lens of being on my deathbed. I know that's a little bit morbid, but I think it's a very useful mental exercise because Mortality is the great equalizer. Money sure doesn't matter anymore at that point. So are you sure you have to spend the next 10 years doing something you hate just to start living your own life one day? Now, okay, maybe you can't just completely do a 180, change your life, jump ship today. I'm not advocating for belligerence, but maybe you can in six months from now, or a year or two from now. The power of fire, and in my experience, perhaps its greatest power, is not to resign yourself 
to some kind of crap for 10 years and then to be free, but maybe it's to build up enough strength in a relatively short period of time and then to use that strength to bet on yourself to bet that if you embraced whatever it is feels like your true self, if you were willing to put in the work to actualize whatever dream it is that you have, that it could happen for you. I waited until I had $90,000 to take this bet on myself, when in reality, I probably only needed like two. I believe fire can get you part of the way but the rest is going to be up to you. Independence in our modern world is something that can come from having a certain amount of money. But I believe that freedom, at least in the true sense of the word, comes from you. And it could be something that you could start having today if you allow yourself to. So this has been a long weaving story through my discovery, journey, and then departure from the church of financial independence. And I hope that if you're still watching this, it has resonated with you in some way. Please remember that I am not perfect. I don't have any of this stuff perfectly figured out and I still have days where I feel like I've gone in completely the wrong direction. You know, there's a common phrase, I think it goes something like, we teach what we most need to learn ourselves. So much of the things that I create are just as much for me as they are for you. A lot of the times I'm creating something as an expression of a question or struggle that I'm having and I don't actually have the answer to it or maybe the right answer to it. And sometimes these expressions of struggles I'm having yield valuable answers and sometimes they don't but if this did for you today then feel free to follow along i expect to continue exploring the topics that i've touched on in this video today as we continue through this year and overall i hope to explore how to live a good life in this modern world that we find ourselves in how to live a life of meaning fulfillment, purpose, how to live a life with independence, not just financial independence, but independence of mind, independence of our location and our time, being a self-sovereign individual. I expect to explore vitality, how to create good feelings inside of your body, how to feel like life is actually flowing through you, mental, physical health, but not just that, how to feel amazing, and I also expect to explore, like I said, meaning and fulfillment and purpose, spirituality, philosophy, moral conduct, what type of character traits we should try and develop as we move through life, and how all of this is increasingly difficult in this modern world that we find ourselves in. So with all that said, thank you so much for being here, if you still are. And I, ho I hope you are well, and I hope to see you again soon.